Good morning, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar. I'm delighted that we're joined by a friend and colleague, Professor Sharath Srinivasan, who is the David and Elaine Potter Associate Professor at the University of Cambridge. And Sharath has, has taken time from what is a very busy time for him uh, to speak to us about uh, the current situation and state of affairs in Sudan. Sharath is going to speak for about 20 minutes as ever, and then we'll go to the all important Q&A with you, our audience. As ever, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom. And um, please feel free to put in questions as they occur to you uh, throughout Sharath's discussion. And we'll set aside uh, the time at the end of the engagement today to go through them. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record and you can interact with uh, the webinar and with Sharath using the Twitter handle at IIEA uh, and indeed Sharath's own Twitter handle, which I cannot recall to memory. I'll now formally introduce Professor Srinivasan and hand over to him. Sharath Srinivasan is David and Elaine Potter Associate Professor at the University of Cambridge's Department of Politics and International Studies. Sharath is also a fellow King's College Cambridge and co-director of the University Centre of Governance and Human Rights. Sharath lived and worked in Sudan in the early 2000s and has been researching on the region ever since and is indeed a, a regional and global voice on the topic. And I'm sure many of you will have seen his, uh, his um, contributions to news media uh, over the past weeks and months. His book, When Peace Kills Politics, International Intervention and Unending Wars in the Sudans is published in 2021 and is visible behind the speaker's right shoulder. Sharath also co-edited Making and Breaking Peace in Sudan and South Sudan, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and Beyond with the British Academy and Oxford University Press in 2020. I'm delighted to have been able to help in, in a small way with that book. I was a PhD in, in, in Sharath's department when that book was coming together and I was one of the research assistants helping bring that book and an important conference together. And I remember immersing myself in, in, in the politics and, and history of the region uh, for a, for a, a lovely summer in 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 2019, I remember it very well, and it's it's lovely to reconnect with Sharath and, and with these ideas in this format. Sharath is also a, a fellow of the Rifts Valley Institute and a trustee of the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Alongside long-standing work on Sudan, Sharath's current research focuses on communication technology and politics and peaceful assembly. Sharath, thank you very much again for being with us, and I hand you the floor for the next 20 to 25 minutes. Thank you, Barry, and thanks to everyone at IIEA for organizing this and for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I hope to um, also join in person not too long from now. Um, I'm off frequently in Ireland, and uh, it's, a, it's always a joy to be there. Um, and indeed, um, Barry uh, does remind me of the work we did together and, and your energy and enthusiasm for that project that led to that edited book. Uh, so it's nice, in a sense, to, to come full circle in that regard. Um, so what I want to do with the 20 minutes I have is... I talk across four headings, I suppose. Um, first, what's the situation right now in Sudan? Secondly, why now? Um, third, uh, what next? And fourth, important for at least me in terms of my academic work, why this situation again and again? How can we understand the deeper logics of what's going on? Um, so let me start really with the, with the situation at the, at the moment in Sudan, uh, where in effect um, one month in um, from when this uh, exploded in, in mid-April, I want to first focus on the humanitarian situation and the human situation to be, to be clear before talking about conflict and peacemaking. And I'm doing that because I think what we're seeing in the last few days is um, how dire um, uh, things are getting on the, on the front of what civilians are facing. Um, that's across the country, but also in seeking to actually leave, um, whether that be to Chad, to South Sudan, to Egypt, um, all of these are really fraught uh, passages to refuge. Um, there's so much that we don't know about what the situation is because of the insecurity. And if we just take even Khartoum, uh, it's very difficult to understand what the scale of civilian death and injury has been, uh, largely because a lot of civilians can't get to hospitals um, and we are not getting data very much out of hospitals. A lot of them are understaffed or have been targeted indeed by the violence and the 
Um, and, and as a result, um, the estimates we have are very sort of provisional. Um, Sudanese Doctors' Union says that approximately 822 civilians have died across the country uh, since the start, but we know that's a massive underestimate, um, and we don't expect we'll get much better data. Um, so in Khartoum, it's a situation where um, all essential services have been either hit and miss or slowly collapsed, whether that be electricity, water, um, access to markets, et cetera, food, uh, and that in the context of sort of scorching heat at this time of year. So there have been a lot of issues of just trying to get basic essentials moving. And a lot of that has happened at sort of very localized community levels. So there has been some efforts to, to ensure that basic welfare is reaching those who are most in need, organized at a very local level. And I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, but the health services themselves have been severely affected. And that in Khartoum means for a city that usually would be about 5 million people, even with the numbers that have left, we're still talking about millions who are in a state of siege and dire um, humanitarian sort of crisis. Um, in other regional centers, El Obeid, which is a, a, a capital city of North Kordofan, which is in the southern part of Sudan. Um, now, that's been a site of tremendous violence as well. Um, the, the Sudan Armed Forces holds the city, but the Rapid Support Forces, the other armed group, um, is on the approaches. It's a strategic location for various reasons. Uh, and their civilian um, deaths and suffering are, are very high as well. The hospital has recorded over 100 deaths um, just in the recent period, over 1,000 wounded from violence. Um, unable to really service those lumbers in, in any sort of decent way. Um, in El Janaina, which is a place in the west of the country, so in West Darfur, that's seen the most violence um, in, in recent weeks that we've documented that target civilians in the city. Uh, and that's a, partly a result of the, the conflict spilling over into a set of dynamics around militias in that area. And so local conflicts mapping onto this wider national conflict. Um, just over the last weekend, um, doctors reported that 280 civilians were killed um, just over the weekend. Um, so we're talking about a much higher level of targeting of civilians in that area um, with a slight ethnic or with a clear ethnic dimension to some of that violence. Um, a bulk of the humanitarian efforts so far has been through Port Sudan uh, in the east of the country. Um, large numbers of internally displaced have fled to Port Sudan, partly with a view to getting to Saudi Arabia, um, and the many thousands, hundreds of thousands have not, and Port Sudan's become a sort of space for displacement from the center of the country. And there, I think the humanitarian effort has ramped up considerably, but Port Sudan is not Sudan, it's, and, and the level of access to of humanitarian assistance to other parts of the country is very patchy at best. Um, and another concern on the humanitarian front is the Egyptian border. A large numbers fled to the Egyptian border, hoping to get into Egypt. Um, but have not had been able to get visas processed. And so that was a, a, a large bottleneck, especially about 10 days ago, um, still remains a very sort of dire situation. And, and that becomes an area of humanitarian need because it's sort of in the middle of the desert and, and thus a sort of a real area of, um, of lack of resource and capacity to support. Um, so that's the sort of humanitarian situation in a nutshell. There's more I would like to say about how... Um, um, how this is playing out uh, in, in troubling ways in terms of targeting of civilians. I'll say that in a second. On the conflict itself, um, both sides have really dug in. So if we thought that maybe there might be a click out or that one actor would prevail quickly over the other, um, that's not the case. So the Sudan Armed Forces, uh, led by General Burhan, um, and the Rapid Support Forces, led by um, uh, uh, General um, Dagalo, and otherwise known as Himeti, these are the, the two dominant actors, as you'll, you'll both, or you'll all know. Um, they both now think that they can prevail for different reasons. Um, the RSF is very strong at urban warfare. In effect, it's a it's a kind of a guerrilla warfare militia. Um, it's much more mobilized, much more uh, coordinated, and sort of, I guess. Um, uh, militarily has uh, been on a, on a on a sort of active footing for, for years now, and so it's much more it was much more able to mobilize in the urban settings and to infiltrate civilian areas, take over neighborhoods, etc., uh, and and make itself hard to to sort of weed out, I suppose. Um, and that's penetrating of civilian areas is a lot involved now, increasing levels of looting pillaging, um, burning of um, various facilities, et cetera, um, but also um, incidents of sexual violence and rape that are on the increase quite clearly. And this is only patchy reporting, but it's very clear there's a pattern here. Um, so targeting of civilians has increased much more of late, and that will continue is, is you know, the, the clear trajectory. Um, so they're holding areas of Khartoum, um, Greater Khartoum, including Omdurman, 
North Khartoum, but also attacking other regional centers. Um, and they um, feel that they're ascendant in some of these areas. There's no doubt about that. Meanwhile, the Sudan Armed Forces is clear and confident that it can hold on to strategic installations, um, some of some of the strategic um, installations in Khartoum, but other regional centers, as I said, like Al Abaid, um, and it dominates in a sense the skies. So the Sudan Armed Forces is well known throughout the history of civil war in the country is that the Sudan Armed Forces is quite happy to bomb, you know, what would be called joint use. Um, you know, facilities, um, but not, not only that, just actually areas that have civilians in them. And this is occurring in now again. You have the RSF infiltrating civilian, heavily civilian populated areas, or, you know, on the weekend, um, Sudan Armed Forces uh, bombed a, a major hospital in, in Khartoum. That's a major orthopedic hospital in the whole country. They bombed the hospital um, because they said the RSF were, were there. So that, that sort of thing is happening a lot more and will continue to happen, especially because the armed forces lacks the sort of ground force infantry um, uh, effectiveness that the RSF has on, on the ground. So it's looking to um, take them out, especially um, from the air. Um, and so again, in both cases, civilians are either being disregarded or being targeted. And, and this is a, a worrying trend there. Um, so then I just want to say very, very briefly, I'll come back to this. Well, what's the peacemaking sort of situation? Um, there have been multiple ceasefires some of the ones, early ones, were not even worth the paper they were ostensibly written on. Um, others held, you know, sort of a limited way, which allowed for evacuations, which was politically expedient for um, one side or the other, as they sought initially to hold some moral high ground. Um, those ceasefires were never going to hold much longer than that, because it was quite clear that they were being broken repeatedly, and both sides thought that they could be militarily, um, uh, uh, you know, um, triumphant in a sense. Um, the more recent uh, talks in Jeddah are at the a formative stage in one sense. And then the most recent thing that came out of that was a commitment by both sides to the principles of international humanitarian law, which, you know, it doesn't take a person with much cynicism to think, well, you know, this is what they should be obliged to follow in the first place. So why does this mean anything? Um, and what does this mean about safe passage? Well, it's meant very little about safe passage um, is, is the truth. And I think what is more important here is to understand what are the, these actors doing when they're sitting in Jeddah with the US and Saudi Arabia seeking to get them to do something because of their relations with these powerful actors. So what are they trying to do in terms of in reinscribing themselves into a space of peacemaking, of um, you know, negotiating tables in which they can claim some legitimacy and be actors that are still relevant um, to those sorts of talks. Um, so I'll come back to that, but I think that's actually, a, unfortunately, a more cynical reading of what's going on in these talks that's important. Um, so why did this happen now? Um, in order to understand what went, what led to this, we have to sort of walk ourselves back through a couple of moments in the last uh, four years since the popular revolution and the deposing of President al-Bashir in April 2019. So the immediate proximate reason that this happened was that there was a agreement in December 2022 called the Political Framework Agreement, which is an agreement between these two actors um, um, on the one hand, and other actors that were in, in holding the, the country um, and power in the country after a coup in 2021, um, and some civilian forces in what was called the Forces for Freedom and Change. And they had sought with international peacemakers to get the um, parties to the coup of, um, April, of October 2021 back to the table of a transition to civilian rule. So this framework agreement in December 2022 was trying to get the transition back on track after the events of, 20, um, of 2022, of the events of 2021. So that framework agreement was calling for a number of things. It was a lot of... Um, uh, the, the overall aim was a transition to uh, interim civilian um, rule, um, leading to elections again, as had been the plan for the transition all along. Um, and in order to get there, uh, some other things would be necessary. One of them would be that the security sector would have to reform and, and there would be only one legitimate armed um, army in the country. Um, and that's involved in part um, negotiations with rebel movements that had already signed on to um, a, a peace process earlier to be part of this reform, but also that the RSF, um, the Rapid Support Forces under Himeti, would merge under the Sudan Armed Forces. Um, and that seems, you know, sensible enough. The, the army can, uh, the state can only have one army or armed forces, and the RSF, which is a militia, needs to merge underneath there. 
But the political power and security power that the RSF had was so significant um, that this was not sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, acceptable to the RSF unless it assumed a dominant position in the command and control of the army. So that was really what was at stake there. And it was quite clear from December last year onwards that, um, you know, the, the town isn't big enough for both of them, but it's not um, easy and really going to be big enough for just one of them or emerged version. And so um, everyone thought that this was going to be a really perilous process. Um, negotiations and discussions had continued throughout early this year, and it was quite clear that both sides were increasingly digging in and um, the army was calling for a two-year transition for the RSF to be merged in. The RSF was talking about 10 years. There was discussions about command and control, but fundamentally it wasn't about the details. It was about the fact that neither side wanted to give up its primary dominant position in the state, which it had held um, for the, the, these last four years. Um, but the other thing that I think we was less obvious, but was also um, anxious for um, the both parties and, and the army as well, was that again, there would be a commitment to a civilian-led transitional government um, uh, that, that would also be part of this period. So that was gonna, that was imminent, and that should have also happened alongside the security sector reform. Um, and so, in a sense, um, the, the reason why this, these, these two fell out was in part because they uh, were seeking to be the dominant security actor, but also in part that neither thought that this transition to civilian-led rule had room for them um, to dominate the state. And that was exactly the same circumstances that led to the October 2021 coup. So the political framework agreement of the end of last year was one long year after a coup in 2021, um, which had led to military actors um, um, taking over the state, these two actors, but also a couple of the rebel movements that had been um, also signed on to the transition and kicking out the civilian led government. And the October 2021 coup um, led um, to a push immediately by peacemakers to get these parties back to the transition, um, to you know, back to the table to negotiate, um, and that was again pushed by especially Western um, and um, peacemakers in what's called the Troika, um, uh, the, the sort of main, the US, uh, UK, um, and uh, Norway, um, and the Troika is a, a, adapted to become something called a Quad, which has involved just the US, UK, Saudi Arabia, um, and. Uh, that that mechanism has sought to get the parties back to the table of the transition whenever there's been a crisis. Um, the civilian protests on the street after the coup were rejecting this and saying, we can't go back to the transition. They've just scuppered um, the earlier agreement to joint civilian military rule and a transition to civilian leadership with this coup. And, and that indeed is important because the coup itself of October 2021 um, was again a response to the fact that the timetable of a transition was calling for civilian leadership to, to come to the helm. Um, and so I think when we look at this, um, we we see a sort of repeated pattern occurring. Um, the October 2021 coup occurred um, because in the context of the transition, in November 2021, civilians were supposed to take over the leadership of um, the, gov the, the transitional government ahead of elections. Um, so that plan and that timetable that had a joint civilian and military leadership of the country, which um, uh, was an agreement that came in August 2019. And so by 2021, that was supposed to transition to civilian led rule. Until then, there was a joint um, sovereign council, but the military and Burhan had still been in charge of the state. And for all intents and purposes, were able to ex exert ultimate supreme power with Hemeti. Now, um, the reason why that joint transitional um, sovereign council came about itself was that when um, President al-Bashir was deposed in 2019 in April, um, the immediate um, cause of that was a palace coup in which Hemeti and the army, not under Burhan at the time, um, deposed Bashir to hold on to the power of the state. And it was only continue, um, ongoing protests on the street um, and indeed a crackdown by the RSF in which they killed a number, um, over 100 protesters in Khartoum that led to a range of foreign actors saying, no, we need to have joint military civilian rule. And they agreed this sovereign council. But the point here is that it's never been in the interests of the military and the Sudan Armed Forces or the RSF to do anything other than hold on to the power of the state ever since those events of April 2019. Um, 
the transitional military council that they created at the time had no room for civilian leadership. And at the time, Himeti was considered the de facto leader of the country. The army was a weaker actor at the time of the deposal of President al-Bashir. Himeti was seen to be the actor that was really at the fore. So if we we see this, then we see both actors need, not wanting to let go of the, um, their control over the state. And actually, Hemeti and the RSF being a preeminent actor at the time of the, the 2019 events of 2019. And since then, there's just been a repeat pattern of agreeing to a transitional process, but maintaining control of the state and security. And whenever the transition was on the verge of a key decisive milestone around civilian rule, um, uh, acting, in a sense, to scupper that, or in this case, falling out with each other over how to maintain you know, power and control. Um, so that's really where we, why we got here. And in terms of what next, I think that the, the key fee, um, worries that emerge at the moment are that at the moment, both actors remain the dominant um, sort of um, belligerents on the ground. Um, this is not the case exactly in West Darfur, where already it's spilled over into the fact that the RSF is aligned to certain Arab militias in, in, in Darfur, um, and they are um, uh, acting either directly at the behest of the RSF or with that kind of um, security support um, to also uh, settle local scores in effect. And this is not something that was, um, this already predates the events of April. So this has been going on for the last few years, ever since 2019, it's been a very restive area. Um, and the the clashes between the non-Arab Masalit um, and Arab militias has been on the rise throughout this period. But now it's being articulated with the dynamics of the national conflict. So the Masalit in this case, who have had an armed militia in the past, are. Uh, quite clearly seeking to rearm or going to Chad and seeking to bring in um, support from Chad. And that is where you can see a contagion potentially um, occurring that is around a set of dynamics that aren't just about these two leaders and they're vying for power and control of the state. Um, Similarly, uh, one of the rebel movements in Darfur, um, this, um, the SLA under Mini Manawi, which has been part of a various agreements for a number of years since um, um, 2019 and, and, and earlier um, has also gone back to Darfur as such. Um, so many men always decamped to Darfur because of concern over how this is playing out in Darfur and a, and, and a desire to, to you know, be a, a security actor in, in their um, home region. So these dynamics are starting to occur um, more um, you know, frequently and they're worrying because they speak to two things. One is the way that either of these actors starts to mobilize other militias um, in order to um, come to their support because neither of them has um, is prevailing at, as, at, at the moment and they're looking for ways to increase their military sort of um, leverage. Um, and that's seen, in fact, the Sudan Armed Forces is certainly uh, seeking alliances in the east um, with um, uh, militias in the east around Port Sudan um, and seeking to say, look, uh, we need to ensure that the RSF doesn't prevail in the country. They're from predominantly Western Sudan, um, and this country can't be ruled by them. And so there's a sort of a, this is starting to happen. It's, it's much more instrumental and tactical, but it's starting to lead to some dynamics that suggest contagion with other armed groups. Um, there's also the regional actors uh, who have been involved throughout in some way and have not been actively involved since last month, but increasingly is a concern that that might be the case, whether that's Egypt, quite clearly strongly supporting the Sudan Armed Forces has been for a long time recognizes in, in, in Burhan and the SAF um, an actor like um, itself and the Egyptian state um, that it can deal with and it can trust and potentially rely upon in crucial negotiations around Nile waters, et cetera, with Ethiopia. Um, but in various ways, Egypt um, is, um, is SAF aligned um, in this conflict. Um, whereas General Haftar in Libya, um, his clear line of support into the RSF has been for a long time. The RSF has also support, supplied um, uh, you know, troops as such to, to his cause in, in Libya. Um, and there's a connection there and a triangle and a connection to the United Arab Emirates, um, who have both been a patron of the RSF um, during the Yemen conflict and tens of thousands of RSF fighters fought in Yemen under UAE patronage. Um, and also the RSF, which controls a large amount or nearly all of the gold production in Sudan has been, um, uh, you know, built a strong relationship with the UAE um, in that regard as well. Um, so these actors are not necessarily fomenting the, the conflict at the moment, but we don't know really what the level of active involvement has been in the very recent 
recent period. Um, and I think we just add Chad and Eritrea as being also key actors in this. And I can talk about that maybe more in the Q&A. Um, I'll just end by just saying very quickly, I mean, why again and again um, is this going on? I mean, my own thinking on this, and, and this stems from looking at peacemaking in the civil wars of Sudan over a couple of decades, is I'm seeing very much similar patterns um, of, of what goes wrong. And it largely involves uh, belligerent actors reinscribing themselves into their political legitimacy via the logics of um, transition planning and peacemaking and roadmaps and framework agreements. And the, uh, the only response that in external actors have to this is to try and stabilize the situation. And to stabilize it means privileging the belligerent actors um, in order to encourage them um, to, to obviously um, desist from, from violence. Um, but the, the mode of doing that tends to reinscribe them in the political domain as the dominant actors. And they know exactly how to um, uh, uh, you know, uh, manage that to their advantage. Um, they're much more effective at managing timetables and roadmaps and these sorts of planning processes such that actually nothing has actually changed in, in terms of um, political power in the country during this period. And we've seen that in the last four years. Um, and what happens along the way is that the civil actors who were there at the heart of the popular revolution, the uprising in Sudan, whether that's the civilian leadership and etc um, or the resistance committees that were central to how that popular revolution occurred and indeed throughout the period since have been the source of a civilian voice but also a resistance and a counter power to these armed actors um, including after the October 2021 20, coup um, they repeatedly are marginalized from the space of um, these political transitions because they one they don't have a seat at the table and two they the promise of a politics to come which is a sort of democratic transition is is means that they're sort of deferred from the political space in the immediate term. But the, re the reality is that the immediate term never changes and, and Sudan is lost in transition in a sense. Um, and while it's lost in transition, these dominant security and belligerent actors um, maintain um, their hold on, on the state, on power, and thus on, on, on sort of the political possibilities in the country. Um, I'll stop there because I know I've gone over time, but um, we can talk more about any of that. Uh, I'm very happy to.